ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get going here with our speakers. Uh, I was saying earlier, we introduced him, lifelong resident of Boston, owns his own music studio, and for the last 10 years has been forging a, a path where he's found himself working with at-risk kids. Um, he uses his music studio as part of it, but it's a whole bunch more than that. Uh, so let's bring him up to the stage right now. Let's hear it. Put your hands together for Mr. Jeff Rogers. This on? My name's Jeff, and I've been working with at-risk youth for about 10 years. And, um, you know, it can be pretty eventful. The, the kids that I work with could have all types of issues, usually emotional issues. They call them severe emotional disturbances, SEDs. And the issues range from maybe bipolar, which if you think about it, if a, if a kid is bipolar, he might have an inability to assess risk. He, when he, in a manic state, he might think, you know, I don't, just because they have a taser and I, I'm naked, I have to lay down, no. Or a kid might have anxiety, agoraphobia. He sees risk everywhere he goes. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, that, you know, a loud noise sends them into fight or flight. So that's what I've been doing for the last few years. And I'll let you guys in on a little dirty secret. We do not have this figured out, folks. It's not figured out at all. So when a kid has PTSD, I've worked, so I've worked as a family partner, helping mothers work with kids with troubles. I've worked as a therapeutic mentor, helping the kids with troubles. And when you do it, when you start off as a mentor, sure, they give you a caseload. First few, they say, how soon can you take kids? We got a, a waiting list. How soon can you take them? And you say, well, what do you want me to do? Well, this kid's got PTSD. What do you want me to do? Mentor him. How? With mentorship. And do what? Mentor. <laughs> what does it mean, mentor? They got nothing. And that's what I love about it. I love that because I love the frontier, wild west of it. It's not solved. Right? So I enjoy it. But the kids are at risk and it's life or death and it's serious. So you also, you also have to care and take it serious. And I do. And over time, I developed kind of a reputation as, uh, you know, somebody with a, maybe a little knack for it. I have a gift for observation. I'm super interested, you know. Uh, my, my knowledge is, you know, a mile wide, even if it's an inch deep. You know what I mean? So I know a lot about it. So when I meet, uh, so when they give me kids, I say, look, I'm happy to work with these kids, but don't give me an eight-year-old with mild ADHD. I want a kid who killed and ate his cat. I want a kid who stole a truck. Something fun. <laughs> so they send me out one day to meet this kid, Anthony. Now, because it's not figured out, I don't even read their case files before I get them because it'll just be full of a bunch of crap that may or may not true, be true. It's not true at the kind of rate where it's super useful. Even if, the, even if I know he has ADHD, what are you supposed to do? Mentor him. So what difference does it make? I might as well just meet him, not have any confirmation bias, get my own opinion. So I go out to meet this kid, Anthony, and I go to talk to him. And he's wearing a hat. So the brim of the hat's like this, and he's turned his head straight down. And he will not look up, and he hasn't even made eye contact with his mother in a year. And so when I go out to meet him, we talk about it, and it turns out that what happened was, so he's diagnosed with uh, autism and he's diagnosed with mild MR, mental retardation. But that's not why they sent me out. Those aren't emotional issues. What happened with Anthony is, one day he was in school, and he was having a tough day, and he went in the bathroom, and he looked in the mirror, and suddenly his chin started disappearing. And he knew that he was hideous and ugly, and that nobody could bear to look at him. And so he hid in there for the rest of the day, and finally the principal drove him home, and he got a baseball hat, and ever since that day, he shielded his face. He wished he had like a man in the iron mask type deal, but on his salary of nothing, he couldn't afford it, so he just used the baseball cap. So we sit and talk, and look, I'm good. I'm a talker. I'm a charmer, right? Jeff, kids love Jeff. So we sit and we talk for two hours, and slowly but surely he's opening up, but he's still looking down. I haven't seen his face. I've been talking to someone for two hours where I haven't seen their face. And at the end of it, he goes, uh, uh, you're nice. You're, fun. you're cool. I like you. Uh, can I look at you? And I think, man... I am good. I'm excellent. Yes, Anthony, you can look at me. 
He said, no, I mean your license. I said, damn, this kid is good. So I give him my license that day. And I'm going to solve this. I'm going to figure this out. So the next time I come back, I measure his chin. I bring a tape measure. He's maybe 17 years old. He lives with his, his, his mother, a pretty but stern Dominican woman, and his little brother. And I measure their chins. And I say, look, your chin's the biggest in the house. Problem solved. Uh, no. It's not solved. So we try different things. Do you believe, how did your chin disappear? What, is, what disease is this? All this stuff. I'm trying to logically get him to see that he has it because Anthony has a chin, guys. I can't see him, but I can hear him talk. He has a chin. So we, we're going through all this stuff, all these ways where I'm going to show him that he has a chin and logic him through it, and then I will have mentored him, right? Well, that's not how it works. And slowly, I began to realize that Anthony didn't think his chin had disappeared. Anthony felt that his chin disappeared. And that's really how all this stuff works. It doesn't matter that you know that flying is safer than driving. When you're in a plane, you feel like the back's going to rip off and you're going to be jettisoned into the Atlantic Ocean. It doesn't matter what you know. It matters how you feel. And that's how risk works. Risk is not something that we're able to assess mathematically. It's something that, in the end, we feel it. And so as I began to be able to acknowledge that, finally, we just tried working on stuff a simple way. The next time I see him, he said, uh, can I look at your license again? You're cool. And I say, no, but I'll tell you what. It's just you and me here. You can look past my shoulder, and I'll look away. And he, uh, I'm scared. Uh, no. I said, I won't look. I know it's hard. And slowly but surely, that's how we evolved. And he would look past my shoulder, and I would look. And then next time, we'd hang out. We'd spend the whole time hanging out, two hours, just doing nothing. Just so that, in the end, I could say, OK, now you'll look at my ear. And now you, next time, now you look at my forehead. And now you'll look at my face, but my eyes will be shut. And now, next time, months and months go by where we're eking forward. And at every step, he's scared. He never felt OK. He never stopped being scared. He didn't stop feeling like his chin had disappeared. We didn't even talk about his chin. What was the difference? It didn't matter what I said. All we had to do was help him to see that being afraid that people would think that you're hideous isn't a reason to hide from the world. Just because you're afraid doesn't mean you should change. And that, effectively, bravery is not absence of fear but the willingness to confront and supersede it. And so one day, as we pushed forward, I saw that he, he, he called me. And he would call me. Sometimes he would call me incessantly, let me tell you. But he called me, and he said, uh, Jeff, uh, today I went to school with no hat. And I said, well, God damn, Anthony. That's amazing, because we hadn't even planned that. And I said, how did you do it? And he said, uh, I, w I was scared, but I did it anyway. And that's how risk is conquered, not with your mind, but with your heart and your willingness to push a little past your limits every day. And that's why that young man is one of the bravest people I've ever known. Thank you. Let's hear it one more time. Jeff Rogers. So I have... Uh, one of the things that I spend a lot of my time doing, besides work, is dancing, right? And I have this guy who's sort of my dance mentor. You, you know, you went through the dance, men you went through the mentor thing, right? And he's, he's, he's an incredibly good teacher. You know, and one day I was saying to him, well, I'm like, how are you so good a teacher? He was like, well, for me, you know, I really struggled for a long time with figuring out how to do this. I had to work really hard to figure out how to do it, and I think that informs my teaching, right? I'm hearing you talk about the work that you're doing mentoring, and it strikes me that I'm guessing that there was somebody at some point in your life who was something of a Jeff Rogers to Jeff Rogers. Uh, who was that person? Hmm. To some degree, getting my cheeks kicked by life. I wish, I think what really happened for me was instead of 
having one person I can point to as a great mentor, I try to be the mentor that I wish that I had. Right. And I don't think I've done anything the short way ever. No. And so I think life, I think the punishment of life has ground mentoring into me. So how do you, how do you end up on the other side mentoring rather than, you know, just being ground down into nothing pounded into the ground? I think, I, I think being hard-headed and just being determined to get different results, you know? And I, got, I, I look at some of the struggles that, that I went through being young, and I look at the young people that I might work with today, and I realize exactly why making those wrong choices are, are attractive to them, but I also realize why they're the wrong choice. The same thing that makes you the coolest guy in the hood at 15 ruin your life. All the girls like you one day, next day, uh, five to eight years. Music studio. Talk to us about it. What do you do there? Well, I also do music, and I got, have a studio. We, you know, I record, produce, whatever, you know, local stuff, whoever wants to get into it. And, I, you know, I have a podcast. We do, so anything, you know, audio related we do. I've done commercials. I've done all types of weird, weird stuff. I did a, a guy who wanted to do a pro Hillary uh, now we, I don't want, this doesn't help my studio, but he had a pro Hillary song that he wanted to record to sell to her. That's something I've really done. To sell to her? Oh, because this is what <laughs> you don't understand, Edgar. When she heard the song. She was going to need to buy it. She was going to need course. to buy it. Of course. And worst case scenario, she didn't like it. Instead of saying, we're going to keep America great, we'll cut another version. We're going to make America great. And maybe someone else might want it. Oh, interesting stuff. <laughs> very, very good. Um, how do I find out about your, your studio, if I'm, if I'm, your podcast? Where do, I, where do I get this stuff? Where do I go for that information? On Instagram and Twitter, at Professor J. Gray, my pseudonym. Nom de plume. There you go. One more time. Jeff Rogers, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, okay, our next speaker. As I said, this is a, this is a man who is a, both a professor of neuroscience and business. Let's welcome him to the stage right now. Let's hear it for Moran Surf. Thank you. So this is risk because uh, 20 minutes ago, I was sure that we're going to be on a Q&A session. Well, I'm just going to have to improvise. And 20 minutes ago, I said, OK, I have to write something and speak for 10 minutes. So what you're hearing now is experience of risk. And in many ways, this is what I've been looking at, at the, in the brain for the last couple of years. So in the last decade, I've been studying the brain, trying to understand all kinds of mechanisms in it and how they work. And every now and then, we poke into a different system. How does uh, feelings work? How do feelings work? Or how do you uh, remember things? And risk is one of those things that neuroscientists have been interested in for a while. And one of the things we learned quickly in the course of uh, the last two decades is that there is no brain area for risk. So in your brain, there is no one single area that lights up when things are risky and shuts down when they're safe. No matter how much we look for it, we see people experiencing all those moments, and there is no certain single area that kind of codes for that. Now that's interesting, because you all know when something is risky, you feel it. At the same time, there's nowhere there that the feeling sits in. So how does it work? First of all, it turns out that more and more we understand that humans invent labels for feelings they have, but the brain doesn't know about those. So even the idea of a feeling is a label we've put. The brain just processes stuff, and it calls these things processes, and we say, oh, this process is an emotion, and this process is thinking. But the brain doesn't know those things. And when you talk about risk, it's even more complex, because there isn't even a single process that computes this experience. So how do we still know it? Well, it turns out that risk is a sum of maybe six different systems that interplay to give you the experience that you call, I'm feeling that it's risky. And those systems code for pretty much everything you can imagine. They have to do with pain. So the pain system lights up, shuts down when you're experiencing risk. It has to do with emotions. Emotions are usually heightened when you're feeling risk. It has to do also with reward. When you overcome risk, the reward system is acting up and it tells you, God, this is amazing. Next time it's going to be even more fun. We should do it even more. Or next time let's not do it because the pain system is also acting at the same time. 
Then there's also element of cognition. You actually become smarter when you take risks and you assess them by looking into it in a very kind of intelligent way. And then there's a sixth one, that's the most mysterious one, which is the mechanics of the brain. Turns out that the brain's mechanics, how many wires are there between one thing to another, actually changes how you perceive risk. Which means that as you grow from being a kid to being an adult and you have more brain developed, more connections developed, you actually change your perception of risk. Which kind of explains why some kids take risks that the same kids when they're 12, 16, 20 years old don't take the same risks. They say, who was I when I went into this particular experience? So over the course of a lifetime as our brain develops, we also change the perception of risk. So now that we know that those systems, the reward system, the pain stimulus, the emotion system, cognitive systems, and the mechanics of the brain all play together into your experience of risk, we know one thing that's important to understand, which is risk is subjective. Because each and every person here has different brains, each of us has different experiences, different pains, different uh, reward systems, different things. Every person in the room has different experience of risk in their lifetime, even within one day. After you tried one thing, it might be not as risky as before. Which also means that we can change perception of risk. So think about that. You go to see Cirque du Soleil. You see a person, a clown, walking on a tightrope. You say, oh my god, this is so risky. They're walking with no net, they can fall, break their bones. This is so risky. The question is, is it really risky? Well, from your perspective, definitely. Because if I put you now on this rope and tried to make you walk, very, very unsafe. A lot of things come into play when you think about it. But maybe for this clown, not risky at all. Because somehow, in their cognition, having tried that enough times makes them actually experience that as a totally safe experience. Think about that from your perspective. You see those stairs. I can go up and down those stairs without thinking about it. But if a baby, maybe a one-year-old baby, would see me walking down the stairs, he or she would say, oh my god, this is so risky, I can barely walk, and look at this adult just walking the stairs without even looking at it. Which means that in the course of my lifetime, when I learned some things, they became less and less risky. So there's a chance that in the brain of this guy who walks on a tightrope, nothing of the systems that work in your brain is actually active. They just don't perceive it as risky. So as we go through life, our brain learns what we can and cannot do, and as we know what we can and cannot do more, we just flag it differently. And it doesn't really feel like risk anymore. Which now, then, brings the question, how can neuroscientists then study risk if it changes across different people and if we kind of can't find this one area in the brain that codes for that? Well, there's a few problems with studying risk. One is that it's really not regarded ethical to put people at risk for the sake of science easily. So this is why I came here, looking for volunteers. Uh, uh, no. Um, Turns out that there's two ways we can do that. First of all, while I said it's not ethical to study people at risk, there are some situations by which science is okay with studying people even through putting them at risk. For example, if you're in Texas, turns out that in Texas, there's a lot different rules when it comes to science, and one of the studies that we conducted involved taking people, lifting them up to 100 feet on a crane, and then dropping them into a place that has like a safety net, so it's pretty safe, but still doesn't feel great for them. And using that experience, not just to measure how risk works in the brain, but also to measure time. So we actually drop them with a clock and we say, while you fall, try to like, look at the time and tell me if it felt like it was two seconds, five seconds, or so on, how long did it take it to fall? And we kind of uh, assess how risk changed the perception of time in their brain. So it took some time, we had to try different states, but Texas allowed us to actually drop people from above. So there was one way to study risk is by just like finding a place that allows you to do whatever you want. But the other way to do it is to translate risk into something that people would experience as risk, that activates all those systems, the pain, the emotions, cognition, reward, and also mechanics, and also at the same time wouldn't put them in danger. And one of the things that we found really works well is money. Turns out that people activate all those systems very frequently when they talk about losing money. In fact, there's a Nobel Prize given to the two people who discovered that risk aversion and loss aversion are partially experiencing like risk. In fact, some people would say that uh, paying money actually feels painful in their brain. There are some studies that show that there's something called pain of paying, which means that when you pay for something, you actually feel a little bit of like pain in your body. And it even changes with how you pay. So you feel a lot more pain when you pay in cash than in a credit card, uh, than in bonds, stocks, and student loans. You can see now why it's easy to uh, commit really big fraud if you kind of mask it into ways that aren't really cash. And ultimately, 
what we do is we have people go to studies where we make them lose money or win money every trial, and we see how they respond to this thing. So here's where I'm going to end. I can tell you uh, a lot about the results that we study, but I'm going to tell you one and a half things that I think are going to be relevant for you. One is, uh, what's the best study to stu uh, for risk that I learned about in the last couple of weeks? And the second one is how you can use that to find a good date. So the best person uh, that studied risk in my mind in a really, really colorful way was a person that said, you know what, I want to study risk. If only there was something that was called risk that I could study, and he figured out that the game risk is the best way to study that. You probably know this game. You have to kind of uh, conquer countries. And what he did is he brought people to the lab and he had them for 10 days, every day, play risk for six hours while he measured their brains. And I won't go into details, but what he found is exactly what moves make you feel like you're taking risk and what makes you not. And he actually saw how losing, winning, uh, earning things, losing things, all of those things actually affect your risk. And he kind of found the combination of science that uh, code your risk. Mostly the take home message is never take the card that asks you to conquer Asia. It's the hardest one to, it's risk entirely because you can attack from anywhere. So it's just like risk with data again, you just experience. And what he also found out when he took it to the real world in a field study was that the experience of risks actually changes your perception of others. So in one of the coolest studies that he did, he took guys and he had them uh, cross a bridge between two sides of a very, very uh, uh, you know, high cliff. It's like a you know, uh, bridge that's very, very kind of scary. And they're asked to cross the bridge from one side to another while he's measuring their heart rate, respiration, all kinds of things. And what he did is he put a trap in the middle of the bridge. He put a woman that would stop them while they're walking and talk to them. Now, in surveys that they ran before, they made sure that this woman was not super attractive and not super unattractive, just regular woman, not, nothing unique about her. Like, she, you wouldn't stand out and you say, oh my god, this is the most attractive woman in any room, just like any other person. The guys walk through the bridge, and in the middle, this woman stops them and starts talking to them about something. She asks them where they're from and a few questions, and then they get to cross the bridge to the other side. As they get to the other side, a survey begins when they're being asked questions about their experience, about things that they went through, and also how attractive is this woman. First of all, they all rank this woman much higher than all the control group. They found this woman much more attractive, and half of them said they were in love with her. <laughs> Turns out that our brain assesses risk Partially by listening to the emotions, and because these people all were under very, very high arousal, meaning their heart rate was high, their respirations were high, they were feeling risk at the moment, their brain interpreted this interaction as, I guess I like this woman much more than I do, she's much more attractive than other people say, and I probably am in love with her. Which is the take-home message. If you're here on a date, and you want the partner to love you more, when you go outside and there's like a car coming really fast, try to you know, nudge them a little bit, uh, hit them a little bit. Something like this is going to be the best way to make them fall in love with you. Thank you. Stay up for a second. Stay up there for a second. Morant Surf, everybody. Uh, you are now, you have now basically dubbed yourself the love doctor. This is the, the love doctor. Um, it seems an amazing task that you're talking about undertaking, this idea of you know, something like risk, how is it that we assess it? What does it mean in the brain? Studying it, trying to figure out all of it. What's the point? What, what uh, you know, aside from the exercise of it, what is to be gained or learned by understanding this better than we do today? Okay, that's a great question. I'll try to answer fast because I know I'm taking a lot of time. First of all, there's a saying among scientists, it's not research, it's me-search, and uh, it has to do with, like, you know, whoever you yeah, are yeah. and whether you like risk or not. But here's why I think it's relevant for everyone, this is why I take it. I think that in society, we kind of uh, forget that risk is subjective, and we think it applies to everyone. So, for instance, uh, someone calculated how risky uh, driving is, and said, okay, we want to minimize accidents, seat belts is the answer. And we all embrace that, and we, all, and we know that it's true, that having seatbelts is safer than not having a seatbelt. But this was an artificial barrier that someone put. Why not just force you to put, also put a helmet on your head and a pillow in front of you? Because someone decided that risk is that much, and we need to get that level of, of survival among us. And I think that we need to remember that risk is something that we need to somehow agree on, 
because altogether we often as society make decisions about what's risky. How many people could, could, could a plane carry? How many people, uh, what should, it should do in the turbulences? All of those things are decisions we made as a society. We live by them and in a way they are subjective. That's important for me to kind of quantify time and again. Thank you. Moran Surf, everybody, the love doctor. We're still feeling good? Nobody clapped that time. That's okay. You only clapped me. Clap. Wait, now we, we, we could just clap in the beginning. We don't have to clap every time. I mean, if you want to, you can. But, like, we don't have because, to. Uh, our next speaker is essentially, or, or was essentially, an investigator. A private. She is a private investigator now. Uh, so let's welcome to the stage right now, Tanya Hoke. I'm very glad to be following Moran because a piece of my talk has to do with just how personal risk is. But I'd like to start with a question. Would you rather be bored or scared? It, scared? Bored? It's not really a question with a right or wrong answer. Your answer to the question might depend on who you are, when I ask you, how much you have to lose, what stage of life you're in. That's because risk is so personal. I've been working in risk management for about 10 years now, but in a particular corner. Like Edgar said, I'm a private investigator. I'm a fraud examiner. And what that really means is that I get hired by my clients to identify hidden risks associated with people that they're thinking of going into business with. Is she the next Bernie Madoff? Does he post sexist rants online? Are they getting ready to take my client's money and run? It's my job to figure this out before my clients lose their money or their reputations. And I've been really enjoying doing this work for industries like software and oil and gas and manufacturing. But a couple years ago, a client asked me to look at a company in the cannabis industry in California. And it was my first exposure to the legal industry. And pretty soon I was completely fascinating. It's this incredible mix of uh, crime and social justice, of medicine and intoxicants. It's states' rights and business like you've never seen before. But it also pretty much broke this finely tuned risk radar that I'd been developing in under other industries. Because in any other industry, if you find out that the person that you're investigating has a conviction for distributing marijuana, it's a deal breaker. But for my clients looking at the legal cannabis industry, that might count as proof of industry experience. Right? In any other industry, I find out that the company I'm looking at is violating federal law, my client walks away. But in the cannabis industry, you have to accept that risk as the price of admission. And a ton of people still want in. So in Massachusetts right now, we have maybe a handful of medical dispensaries operating in the city and about nine statewide. But the National Cannabis Industry Association predicts that by 2020, our market will be valued at $1.1 billion. For the country as a whole, I've seen estimates varying in the same time frame, 2020 to 2021, from between $17 billion to $22 billion. So if you're looking at the business side of this, it's, it's hard to stay away. But here's the thing that I've learned from looking at businesses in this industry that I didn't appreciate when I was looking at the more boring industries like oil and gas. When I say that risk is personal, I also mean that it's unevenly distributed across race and across class. So according to the ACLU, whites and blacks use marijuana in this country at about the same rates. And if we're being honest, white people use it a bit more. But a person of color is 3.7 times more likely to be arrested for a marijuana-related offense than someone who looks like me. And that means that my worst case scenario, talking about this industry, and your worst case scenario might look very different. On top of that, there are huge economic barriers to entering the legal side of this business. If you want to open a medical dispensary here in Massachusetts, you need to be able to demonstrate that you have access to half a million dollars in capital. In Pennsylvania, that number goes up to $2 million. 
So we're not exactly talking about small business stakes here. And because of systemic racism in this country, the people who have been most affected by prohibition are also those least likely to have access to the capital needed to start a business on the legal side of the industry. It's a problem that really needs solving. And one of the things that's exciting looking at this industry is seeing the ways that different cities and states are trying to remedy this. So in Oakland, California, the city council is proposing rules that will uh, make sure that licenses go to people who have prior convictions for marijuana. And then they want to provide those applicants with zero interest loans. So they're addressing both the, ra both the, uh, the race side of this and the class side. It's really important. Here in Massachusetts, the recreational initiative that we passed last year includes a requirement for the new Cannabis Control Commission to um, promote the inclusion of communities that have been affected by prohibition. And this is so important. And if we talk about risk in the industry more broadly, the most in interesting piece of the risk is not that it's illegal at the federal level, which is interesting, or that you might worry about your professional reputation being associated with an illegal drug. But it's the unexpected risks that are really fascinating to me. It's hard to get a bank account if you're a cannabis business, even if you're legal at the state level. That's because banks are federally insured and cannabis is illegal at the federal level. So a bank that works with you if you're a cannabis business can get in trouble for laundering drug money. Now you're operating in cash. I want you to try to imagine as a small business owner that you're going to be able to pay your rent, your internet bill, and your utilities, your employees, and your attorney all in cash. Out west, they've had to set up special cash rooms at the state government offices to accept tax payments from dispensaries that are all coming in in cash, stacks of $20 bills. It's a huge security risk. You might worry about your employees getting mugged at the end of the day. So, yeah, it's exciting. It's a big industry, there's a lot of potential, and the difficulty of operating in the industry creates a lot of opportunities for people to be creative. There are software solutions for seed to sale tracking, which helps make sure that legal product doesn't get diverted into the black market. People are coming using um, blockchain and Bitcoin to solve the problem of lack of access to banking so that people don't necessarily have to pay in cash for their marijuana. They can go in and, and still use the payment modes that they're used to. On the medical side, we're finding ways to separate out the uh, seizure-reducing components of marijuana from those that cause a buzz so that children with epilepsy can reduce their seizures without getting other side effects. And that's awesome. And it's a fascinating industry, and I think we should all be paying attention to it. But as part of that, I want us to remember, again, just how personal and unequal risk really is. I've learned from looking at this industry that it's not right, it's more or less misguided to simply tell someone no risk, no reward. How can that possibly be the way to go when your personal risk exposure is tied to so many factors outside of your control? So instead, what I advocate for is efforts to level the risk playing field so that then, and only then, we'll be able to genuinely ask people, how about you? Would you rather be bored or scared? Thank you. All right, Tanya, don't go anywhere. Tanya, don't go anywhere. So I get to hang out with the speakers for a, a little while before we come out here and, and do our thing. And we meet in the green room, and we've had some phone calls before, and we're chatting and stuff like that. And I ask them about themselves and try to understand them, whatever. And uh, so I was like, I, you know, I'm, I'm always I'm like, but tell me something, you know, offbeat, interesting, whatever that you wouldn't expect about you. And, and, and Tanya says, well, I don't know if this is interesting, but like, you know, I, I went to college and I majored in Chinese and I minored in philosophy. Now, I, I want you to explain a little <laughs> bit about how you go from Chinese and philosophy yeah. to where you are. Like, what is the, what, how does that happen? How do you go from there to here? Yeah. How, like, really? Yeah, no. And yeah, exactly. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. And also, 
Tell us in Chinese, in yeah. Mandarin, which that, I think was your specialty. That would be even more impressive. Uh, yeah, my, my father likes to say that I'm a postal child for liberal arts education. Um, Are there any Mandarin speakers here? <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Tell us, <laughs> so can you say something in Mandarin? <laughs> that might not have been real, but and great job. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, I, um, I majored in Asian studies with a yeah. focus in Mandarin uh, and Chinese history. Uh, I was fascinated with China when I discovered that I hadn't learned any Chinese history in high school, despite being a history nerd. Yep. Uh, and also that their history went back way further than all of European history or U.S. history combined, pretty much. Uh, and I... Uh, I thought when I applied for the job that I ended up taking after college that I was going to be a political risk analyst. So I was going to advise companies on how to do business in China. But the company I applied to said, that's, that's really sweet, but you need a PhD. Uh, have you considered corporate investigations? And uh, huh. my answer was, I have no idea what that is, but it's 2007 and I would like a job. <laughs> and I slid right in there before the Great Recession hit. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and pretty soon I discovered that I was working with former spies and former military officers, law enforcement, uh, and the like, and that it was exactly where I wanted to be. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm still sort of interested because the, the, the sort of risk assessment thing is right there in the beginning in this job that you were looking at. So yeah. how did you learn the risk assessment piece? Uh, I was, I did a, okay. So I went to a college that's known for being super nerdy and very academic, and some ridiculous percentage of the students there end up going to, uh, on to PhDs. Uh, and I didn't want to go into academia, uh, mm -hmm. but I thought maybe a think tank is, is the right balance for me. And I went and interned in a think tank and discovered that it wasn't, um, it was still too academic. So I, I was just, it was part of an effort to get closer to having an impact on the world. Um, in my, yeah, in my case. And now you're doing it. And, and you're having an impact here at WGBH yeah. Boston Talks. Thank you, Tanya Hoke, everybody. Let's hear it for her. We're going to moderate applause. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the applause back there. So who here, uh, who here's had some of the honey uh, in the honey tasting spot in the back? Yeah, it's pretty darn good, right? Uh, if you have not, you still have time. Uh, I bring it up only because our next speaker is responsible for that honey. Well, not directly, but indirectly. He's not actually making the honey. But he's making the conditions in which the honey can be made, sort of. That's maybe a way to think about it. So, uh, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Noah Wilson Rich. Thank you, Edgar. Thank you guys for being here. What a fun night, right? So, to close out the risky show, whoa. There's a, there's a play on risk, right? I'm up here. I'm taking a risk talking to you guys. I, uh, I need to start off with that fact of 1 in 80,000 people, we've been told tonight, die from hornet, wasps, and bee stings, right? So in defense of bees has become my career. I don't know how this happened to me. I don't know how life happens to each of you, but here we are all together tonight taking a risk together. Bees are vegan. <laughs> Wasps and hornets are meat eaters. Unfair to lump them in the same dangerousness category, okay? In defense of bees. Now, I compare this to Jurassic Park, so let's continue talking about risk. Let's take a field trip back a few years maybe combined into Hollywood, and imagine walking to Jurassic Park and you see the dinosaurs. What do you feel? Kind of scary, right? Do I take a risk and go into the park? We well, you know how that goes every few years. We get reminded. <laughs> but yet, in these movies, you still see the kids that go up and pet some dinosaurs. So there are some that you can pet. We might want to call those the vegan dinosaurs. Maybe the bees of the Jurassic Park world, perhaps. So vegans tend to be nice. They don't have to kill to eat by nature. 
we're not talking about humans for a moment here, but we're talking about natural veganosity. So the brontosaurus is where the kids are petting. Even though it looks scary and in fact is much larger, perhaps, than a T-Rex or other velociraptors or things that are actually going to kill you because they need to eat you. That's how they eat and get by. So those are the meat eaters, like the wasps and the hornets, that have to kill to eat. They can sting multiple times, whereas bees, some do not sting, some die when they sting, and that's about it. The ones that don't sting, the stingless bees, they bite. <laughs> the message there is that everything can defend itself somehow, right? If you are at risk and you're feeling a little tense, you will, by nature, get a defensive posture. Put them up. Let me see you all put them up tonight. <sighs> Right? If you're feeling at risk, you're going to react somehow. But you're not always going to take the next step. And I think that that's that risk threshold, that fight or flight, that rush of endorphins. That's something that's exciting and for me has been a part of not only my professional career, but certainly my personal life. We are products of school, and in school you're told to pick a subject, and then when you go to grad school, you have to focus, 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 and write a dissertation, and then when it's time to get a job, you have to be well-rounded. You have to know many different things. It's really tricky, but that's how I got to this stage tonight, so I want to back up a little bit and ask about you. I already know about me. I want to see a raise of hands for those of you who are scared of bees. Raise your hands. All right, cool. Nice to meet you. I'm Noah. <laughs> now, a raise of hands of people who are scared of heights. I'm going to raise my hand higher this time. Right. So, combine the two together, and then raise your hands if you would be scared to check a beehive on a skyscraper. Let's see. Okay, good. So you are the people who we like to hire at the Best Bees Company. We like to train people on how to be beekeepers on day one by throwing you into a beehive. There are only so many books you can read about beekeeping before you have to just do it. And there are only so many times you can think about the top of a building before you have to just get there. Or for me, like a wuss, I hate jumping into pools. I have a thing with that. I don't know what it is, but you have to just do it. So as a kid, I had many interests, and I followed them all, but I didn't know what to do with my career. And this is eventually what got me to bees on skyscrapers and getting over my own fear of these. My father would say, go to med school, son, then we'll talk. And I would say, gee, thanks, Dad. I know that you love me, but I don't know what to do with my life. So I just took whatever classes were interesting, and that led me to animal behavior classes and sociobiology. Have you ever heard of that as a class? It's one of these college catalog things you stumble on, like, hmm, sociobiology, like social animals, I'm kind of social. And biology, okay, I like animals, so let's take it. Right? And I just took a gamble. I took a risk on a class that was not medical school, which is what I was doing at the time. And it was taught by a sassy Latina professor. I kind of had a crush on her. We still work together today, so don't tell her this. She's what changed everything for me. I took this risk on a class, and she opened up my eyes to the wonderful world of social insects. What? I was not the type of kid who grew up playing in the dirt. I didn't like bees. I didn't like anything in nature. I just wasn't that type of kid. But this class showed me how wasps, ants, termites, and bees are highly social, maybe more social than humans are. Like, we don't have a queen human. We almost did, maybe a little bit last year, but we <laughs> don't. What is so fascinating, if you look at the history of this country, is we've only had male presidents, but when you look across the spectrum of social insects, you don't see the kings, do you? Natural selection has favored the queens. So I started drawing these parallels between what can we learn as humans from what social insects do, and how can that make us better, so to speak? Not better in terms of dominant, but the best humans we can be, so to speak. It's been such a fascinating journey. And so that led me to start working with bees. I started working with bees in 2005 just because I was interested in the things we just talked about. 2006, bees started dying in mass. They weren't just dying, but colony collapse disorder was making their bodies disappear. 
Bees were vanishing. And this is something that made it into the New York Times in 2007 with Mae Berenbaum, one of my idols, who wrote an article, scientist communicating with the public, saying, guys, we need to care about this. We need to care about bees, not just because scientists think they're cool, but because they pollinate and give us food. Los Angeles made beekeeping illegal in June of 18. 90, in the 1890s, I can't leave here, of course, uh, and 1889, and uh, because people thought that bees attacked fruit. People saw bees at orchards and thought that that's what is stealing our food instead of what's giving us food. And that remained on the books, illegal beekeeping in LA, until December of 2015. It was a unanimous vote with the LA City Council, 15 to zero, bipartisanship, right? <laughs> because bees are food. They contribute $100 billion to the global economy every year for the role as pollinators of over 70 fruit and vegetable crops. There are many different species of bees, like the alfalfa leafcutter bee. If you didn't care about the alfalfa leafcutter bee, then know that it contributes over $7 billion to the US economy every year for giving us hay and alfalfa, and that's what cattle eat. So our whole dairy industry relies on bees as well. Bees were dying in 2006. People came to me like, hey, bee guy, what's happening? And it made this weird thing I was doing so much more relevant. I was also living in Boston at the time, going to Tufts for grad school, and my beehives for research in the city were doing way better than our beehives at the Tufts Veterinary School out in Grafton, Massachusetts, and way better than anywhere outside of the cities in general. Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, most honey production and the best survival of beehives still eight years later since we started collecting data. It's undeniable. The question is, why are bees doing so well in cities? So even though colony collapse disorder ended in 2011, just as mysteriously as it started, and I wrote this bookend piece in the New York Times in 2014 to announce to the public, hey, colony collapse disorder is over. We're, we're Still in a crisis though, bee bodies are dead. We have to pay attention. What we're paying attention to now is that bees are doing better in cities. They're doing better the higher up we go. Our data have found that bees on skyscrapers are the ones that are thriving, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Leading me and my research with my bees higher and higher. We're now understanding why, and that's the fun thing for you to think about. So I hope that I've encouraged you to change your mind a little bit for those of you who are not so into bees, I get it. And maybe to change your mind a little bit too about ecosystems on skyscraper rooftops. There's apparently a ton of spiders up there too, right? If you weren't scared of the other things, <laughs> here we go. It's an ecosystem that we're creating and it's important to pay attention to it and to collect data from it. So when you taste the honeys in the back, those are Boston honeys, we are sampling the DNA of the Boston honeys to understand how many different flower species are in the city. And it seems as though that's the explanation. Habitat diversity is better in cities than it is in the countryside these days. There are more plant species in the cities. So what you can do to help bees, of course you can get beehives to get more bees out there, but you can plant a flower. So my whole life's work comes down to that message. To each of you tonight, I want you to go home and plant flowers, taste some honey here, and hopefully less of you will raise your hand next time I ask you how many of you are scared of bees and skyscrapers. Hopefully this encourages you to taste a risk a little bit more. Thank you. Noah, bee man, very nicely done. So, um, did you did you ever did you ever have like in your develop like when you started becoming a bee guy? A bee guy, yeah. Were you like, this is a little weird. Like, how did you explain it to your friends, to your family? Like, as it all started to happen, were you like semi embarrassed about the fact that you were becoming obsessed with bees? Like, yeah, totally. Well, it's so interesting because before bees was termites, right? So I think everybody was pretty relieved. Who hasn't been through the? I'm into termites, now I'm into bees thing. It's <laughs> so it happened classic when progression. I, I was so passing. I was really into this professor, and she <laughs> happened to be working with termites. And huh. so she hired me in her lab to essentially feed them wood. You know, we had an axe. 
<laughs> and uh, and the research, I was I was concerned that we were going to hurt the termites in the end. Why? Uh, because we were killing them. It was like <laughs> pest control stuff, and I didn't want to go to heaven. And the gates of heaven are there, and then there's all these dead termites that had souls in the end, <laughs> thinking, no, you can't come in, right? So I thought, okay, let me switch this up. What's a beneficial social insect? That's how I and got that's to how bees. You came, that's how you found bees. Yeah. So do you do the whole, do you like put a beekeeper outfit on and yeah. the smoke and the stuff like that? Beekeeper suit, yeah. So how many times have you been stung? Like, do you, like, it, does, it, does it happen a lot? Does it not happen a lot? Like, you know, talk it, to me about the risks of yeah. beekeeping. So since I've worked with exclusively honeybees, I don't get stung very much. I used to work with wasps. I used to moonlight a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so just that's when I would get stung after a lot Only more. after dark. <laughs> yeah. You know, when after you, dark with the wasps. Yeah, exactly. Bees by day yeah, just for wasps a side gig. Yeah. But, you know, if you get a bee in your beekeeper suit stuck in there, you can feel it like, uh-oh, you know, I'm in, <laughs> I'm in trouble. But if you do get stung, it's one sting, and the venom is not as strong as with wasps. If you have a wasp in your beekeeper suit, that's when you do the dance. You know, and it's not the waggle dance, the Nobel Prize winning research. That's not that one. Because it'll keep stinging you, and that's a very different look. But I've been stung probably hundreds of thousands of times. No big deal. Um, have, you, have you become like, is, is tasting honey for you now like, like really annoying wine people with wine? Is that like how you are it, when, it, when it comes to honey? I can get that way. Yeah. It's really fun, actually. So there's now a honey tasting society of America with the tawar of honey, right? You can really get there now with the honey DNA. So when we know what we're tasting, this is going to be the next food explosion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, give, give us the insider tip. What's, what's the hot best thing to be like eating honey with or putting honey in? What's yeah, oh, it's so fun, right? So honeys in New England start very light in color and then they get very dark in color in the fall. So you can all be experts now. If you see a local honey and it's very dark, you'll say, oh, what a nice fall honey, nice. right? And it pairs well, pairs well with stronger stinky cheeses, you know, and okay. the lighter honey can be a little more floral, you know, so you can do that with a, you know, mild cheese. But those are my favorites the cheese pairings, and go to Follow the Honey in Harvard Square. You can taste all the honeys there. It's a great store. Not mine, just love to promote it. There it is. Let's hear it for Noah. <laughs> Gang, we're going to take one more short break. Stick around. We're going to bring all of our speakers back up, and I'm going to come out and give you guys a chance to ask questions to them. So think a question up. you want to ask, raise your hand. I'll come find you, and, uh, and we'll chat with the panel here. Anybody at all. I'll come to you in a minute. We got a question over here. What's your name, sir? Marty. For a bank robber fellow, how did you get yourself declared dead? Uh, it, there it comes. So the short version, because there's a lot of components that were that uh, this is when I was living in Israel. One of the jobs we were asked to do was to break into the equivalent of the IRS system, the tax, the social security system. So this is a database that the government owns that has an entry for every person. And it says like their first name, last name, date of birth, uh, stuff like that. And one of the fields there is alive or dead. And it's a binary flag. Like basically, when you're born, it's one. And when it's zero, when you die, one. And that's kind of how they monitor that. So now the, the way we worked was we were asked by the company to try to break in and prove that we can get in. So when we did, we usually made a little kind of documentation of how we got there and the process. So, okay, so I, I work with my team, I go home on Thursday night, and I tell one of my employees, like, just before you go home, make this, like, you know, five minutes movie of how we break into the system and change something. So he goes, and he changes my record from being dead to alive. Sorry, being alive to dead. For like a second. So he goes, he changes the zero to one, and then changes it back and just films everything so we can have a way to show. Turns out, no one thought that people would come back to life after they died. You know, maybe outside of Elvis, uh, Jesus, and uh, Tupac, yeah. <laughs> Most people don't come back. So, uh, so no one programmed into the system that this flag, if it changes back, actually should mean something. And this system feeds into hundreds of systems in the country. Banks and the, so, so, lo and behold, Monday morning when I show up to the bank, I can't take anything because the bank thinks I'm dead. And my parents start getting flowers from like insurance companies. That, uh, uh, and millions of things kick in like as soon as you die. Uh, I found it funny, but my parents didn't really like it. Uh, uh, 
and so there, there are some good things, like um, all my parking tickets were cancelled. Uh, uh, so there are some good things, but one of the bad things is that you can't change it back. So it really was no way. Like we went to all, the, we changed it back. That doesn't matter. Like yes, no system reads after after that. So ultimately, after we played with a lot of ways to fix it, we had to go to a judge who ruled that they're going to put another entry for me. And now there's basically two people in Israel that are identical, but one of them is dead, one of them is alive, and that's the only... And every now and then there's still problems with that. That's... Wow. Great. We, we got another question over here. What's your name, sir? Rai. Rai, welcome. You having a good time? Yes. Excellent. What's your question, Rai? Um, so I guess this is for everyone, not just the most interesting man. But um, what is the biggest risk you took that turned out way worse than you expected and way better than you expected? Huge. So we're going to go down the line. Who, yeah, Jeff's like, somebody else go first. Uh, risks you've taken, one that turned out well, one that turned out not so well. Mm. A risk I've taken that turned out well. That's really the hard one. I got so many that went poorly. Gosh. Um, I'm struggling to think of one. A risk that turned out well. I mean, I think building a music studio, right? Something I, I, I sized it up and I think I said, oh, maybe, you know, if I do this perfect, I think it'll take me, you know, a couple weekends. It took me 18 months, right? And I had to learn how to be a contractor and I got horsehair plaster in my eye and it was pretty much a nightmare. And that's before you have a single client. So that was a big risk, but it turned out well in that I have it now. So I feel good about that. And every other thing is the stuff that turned out wrong. <laughs> All right, who, who else? Who else wants to get it? Noah. No, nah, Noah, you have the mic. Go ahead. No, uh, go ahead, Noah. All right. So, uh, yeah, so I'm a, a scientist first, but an entrepreneur second, really. Uh, I started a company with a free Facebook page while in grad school out of a way to fund my research. So kind of similarly affected by a bad economy in a way, like there are no jobs for B scientists in a good economy, right? <laughs> so I took a risk there, and uh, eight years later, we've raised over a million dollars for B research. Like without grants. Just Round of applause for that, guys. million dollars for, for that. anything. That was really weird. Uh, burning some bridges by not doing traditional jobs there. Uh, and a risk that didn't turn out well was one time while beekeeping, I was rushing and I just picked up two beehives and put them in my car because I had to go deliver them really fast. Uh, I didn't have time to like close them up or put a beekeeper suit on, I was, I was rushing. And I hit, a, I hit a bump on the highway and those two beehives exploded in my car. And I pulled over real quick and I just kind of ran and got into that deep zen moment when you're in too deep with a risk and you just have to breathe it out, you know? And then everything calmed down and the bees aren't aggressive so they all calm back down and then I just closed it up and, uh, and just slowly drove back to where I started. So that did not go, don't rush a risk. Tanya? Sure. Let's see, uh, a risk that, the first line of my speech was originally going to be that I'm not a risk taker, um, which is ironic for someone who's in risk management. Um, but uh, I would say with my not being a risk taker in mind, uh, there are risks that you don't know that you're taking. Uh, one morning on my way to work some years ago, I uh, fainted on the subway. It's the one and only time that I've ever fainted on the subway. And you wouldn't think that taking the subway was a risk but uh, I managed to crack my skull. Uh, and thank goodness for health insurance. So we'll leave that risk at that. Uh, a risk that went well, I, I would put it in the same category as uh, starting a business. Um, I never planned to start my own business. Uh, I went to graduate school thinking that I was going to work in security consulting. And then I uh, heard a lot of business case studies in business school that all featured um, men from Harvard Business School. And the only women who appeared in those case studies were their wives or girlfriends who were complaining about the credit card debt that they were running up. And I thought, well, maybe I can do that too. And, uh, and that was four years ago, and I've decided that it wasn't a stupid decision. So, so far, so good. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we're still waiting for you, Moran, on this one. I, th I think you, I mean, the risk of why don't we videotape you making me dead and then alive again sounds like that was a pretty bad risk because you ended up dead, unfortunately. I mean, not really dead, but legally dead or systematically dead. Uh, but how about a risk that turned out well for you? 
this evening. I, I'm so, uh, um, <laughs> I think is okay. okay. Yeah, we're well, glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, so, okay, so I mean, I'm gonna, I can give you a boring answer, uh, uh, which is in my line of like thinking about risk. I, I feel that we define risk usually in retrospect. So we fear is something we experience. Like you said, this is gonna be, I'm, I'm afraid to jump. But usually when we jumped and we kind of think about it, we say, oh, this wasn't risky or this was risky. So I think that it's really hard to trust even our own like perception of this. Like before, things like much riskier than after. Uh, this, like, if you're a tight rope walker, people would ask you, you would say it's not risky, but you won't remember that it was risky in your mind the first time. So I think risk, you know, in many ways to me is like a subjective thing that changes over our lifetime. So even whatever answer I'm going to give you is going to be a lie. Okay. That's a very neuroscientist-y answer right there. I'm Edgar B. Herwick III. One more time for our speakers and everybody get home safe. Thank you so much. You know, one of the unexpected things is when you hand someone a beer with instructions on it, and it happens to be a 7.5% alcohol beer, they don't always type the instructions quite right. And those were some of the most yeah, yeah. fun tweets <laughs> yeah, we got. I can imagine.